we're wrapping up a series right now, uh, kind of our first series of the summer. Uh, we have been in a series, this will be week three of our series called Six Letter F Word. Our, our heart in this series has been to reclaim the word father because if I know a lot of people grew up like I did and, and maybe still feel like I did when I was growing up where that word father is kind of a cuss word and, and it, it's been kind of dragged through the mud. And so we started on Father's Day really talking about how we could see God redeeming and reclaiming this idea of fatherhood. And so we spent a couple of weeks talking about God as our Father. You know, the Bible talks about Him being a heavenly Father. And this week we're going to land the plane on this series and kind of bring it full circle and talk about something that we started to dig into a little bit on week number one, and we're going to talk about what it might look like for us to embrace this, the heart of the Father in, in our modern world. But let me just give you a little bit of a reminder. There are, we said this during uh, the first week of our series, that there are 19.7 million children, that's children under the age of 18, currently alive in the United States of America, 19.7 million children who are currently living with no father figure in their home. Now that's like one is too many. 19.7 million is equal to, we said this on the first week, it's equal to the, the nation of Malawi. Their population is 19.7 million. They are uh, the 60th largest nation in the world. That's how many children there are uh, in the United States living without a father figure in their home. And as we look at that, we also begin to realize that not only are there children who are living without a father figure in their lives, that there are a lot of Christians who are living without a father figure. And, and, and there's even kind of a Christianese term. Uh, Christianese is our own special little language that we created, where if you come to church long enough, you know all the special phrases that we use. Uh, but, but we throw around this phrase, spiritual father or spiritual parents, uh, in church circles, maybe you've heard that. Maybe, you've, maybe you're thinking already of like, yeah, I have a spiritual father or I have a spiritual mother. Really, in 2019, we, we actually more often call those people mentors, uh, right? Uh, or you might call them a coach or uh, the, a, a life coach is, is kind of a, a phrase that gets thrown around a lot. But really, there is an idea that in Scripture that you should have spiritual parents. And, and in fact, there's even an idea in Scripture that you should be a spiritual parent, right? I know I got, my wife is excited about that. I know one other person said amen, I think, and I got a nod from Debbie. All right, <clears throat> amen. All right, so we want to talk today about what it might look like for us to be spiritual parents because the goal of this series is to redeem the heart of the Father, and I don't think that we can do that unless we bring it full circle and that we understand that what God is to us, we're also supposed to give away to other people. So he's a good father. We've been talking about that for two weeks, how he's a good dad. It's just in his character to be good all the time. He can't not be a good father. And then last week we talked about how because he's a good father, he blesses his kids with good gifts. In fact, last week we even saw that one of the things that God gives us is an inheritance. He calls us to be the heirs of the, the blessing or the covenant or the promise of Abraham. Now, Abraham was given the blessing uh, from God. He was called to be a, a, a follower of God. And then God said, if you follow this co covenant that we make, this agreement that we make together, I'm going to bless you so much that you're going to overflow blessing onto other people. And so we know that as we inherit the blessing of Abraham, we're also supposed to be a blessing. That's what it looks like for us to receive fatherhood from God and then try to figure out how to be spiritual parents as well to other people. And can I just be real clear here that this is not a message just for the guys in the room. Although, just like we said uh, earlier in this series, ladies, I know that you get excited when the men in the church step up and become everything that God has called them to be. And, and fellas, I, I know you get excited when the ladies step up and become everything that God has called them to be as well. Isn't it great if we would all be everything that God has called us to be? And can I just tell you right off the bat, I'm not going to bury the lead here. I'm just going to tell you from the very beginning, none of us can be everything that God has called us to be unless we embrace those that are spiritual parents to us and, un and unless we also embrace being a spiritual parent to someone else. In fact, let me put a different word on that. The word is discipleship. 
And do you know that Jesus, one of the last things that he said before he ascended to the right hand of the Father, if you've read all the Gospels, you know that at the end of Jesus' time on earth, he rose from the dead and he hung out with his disciples for a while and then he looked at them and he said, go and make disciples and teach them to essentially make more disciples. So if you're a living human being, God has given you <clears throat> a mandate. Can someone get me some, my wife has some. I know I'm good. I just also need some water. Arrogant? Did that sound arrogant when I said that? I know that I'm good, but I, it's just because, it, it's just because my wife tells me I'm good. I really believe her. All right, anyway, what was I talking about? I was talking about discipleship. So Jesus gives this command to make disciples, and what he was saying was make disciples, say disciples. Disciple means student or follower or representative as well. Uh, and, and he says every single person who is a follower of Jesus needed to go make disciples. And then he said, teach them everything that I taught them. And what did he teach them? Well, the last thing he taught them was to make disciples. So including, included in everything that you teach someone, you're also supposed to teach them to go and make disciples disciples. So essentially what Jesus is saying is that if you're a Christian, if you're a living human being, receive the love of Jesus, become a disciple, and then teach other people to become disciple-making, disciple-making, disciple-making disciplers. And you see how that has trickled down throughout history to that's the reason you're sitting here, because someone who was a disciple made a disciple, right? And now what's interesting, though, is that we have actually interpreted in the modern church that disciple means help someone become a church attender and then hands off. And that is not disciple making. Disciple making is actually more like being a parent. So I, I've got a couple of kids, and just for the record, making them was fun. Having them was hard, and raising them is harder. And if all I did was the fun stuff, I'm not a father. You, under, you understand what we're talking about here, right? Okay. I'm just saying there's a lot of Christians who like to do the fun stuff and lead people to Jesus and then don't want to walk with them with Jesus. And a lot of that is actually our fault. And when I say our, I mean like leaders of the church because we actually have kind of perpetuated this stereotype that we'll do all the hard work for you. You just bring them to church and we'll make disciples out of them, which is not what Jesus said. He didn't say, all right, go and plant churches and then hire a person who that person will uh, make all the disciples and you just drag people into the building. And, and if you can do that, then then the pastor will make the disciples. No, it said all of you make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. What I'm telling you is that every single one of us who has any kind of a relationship with God is supposed to be making more children of God. And you don't make a child of God just by doing the fun stuff. You also have to be committed to helping them grow up as well. Right? There's already too many of you in this room alone for just me to be able to disciple all of you. I mean, some of you have tried to have a meeting with me recently. There's more of you than I have hours in the day, and I, I would love to be able to sit down and meet with every single one of you. What I would love more is if we could do that with each other, right? My pastor taught me when I was coming up, he said, always try to work yourself out of a job. If I could make myself useless because you guys are so good at being spiritual parents, awesome. It'd be so great if you were so busy making spiritual children and raising them. And so that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today, because can I just tell you the truth that all of that sounds really cool, but you're probably sitting here going, but I don't have time for that. I don't know enough about how to do that. I'm not good enough of a Christian to do that. You don't know what I was up to yesterday. I'm definitely not eligible to do any of this, right? And, and like you're thinking, like, I, how could I possibly do all of this? And this whole series really has been wrapped around this one promise. In Luke chapter 1, verse 17, there's this one phrase that has stuck, stuck out. And I've really been chewing on this for several months. And it says, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. 
And this is something that I've been praying for you as people who come to this church and, and people who are members of the family of God, that there would be something of the hearts of the fathers turned to the children and, and something of the hearts of the mothers as well turned to the children. I just want to talk for a few minutes about what it would look like for us to embrace this call to be spiritual parents because it's it sounds hard, and a lot of us don't do it because, well, for one, we aren't taught, and then maybe another reason is because we're intimidated or we don't feel eligible. So I want to get into that for a little bit today, but can I give you some context to this, to this verse? Because this is a verse, Luke one seventeen, and by the way, that's not even all of Luke one seventeen. It'd be helpful if we put it in its context so that we can understand what it actually looks like, because I think when you begin to see this in its context, you might actually begin to see and this is my goal by the time I'm done talking to you today, that you not only should, but you can be a spiritual parent. We overcomplicate this. It's a lot easier than you think. Now, you don't have an option if you want to become everything that God has called you to become. If I'm talking to people today who aren't interested in serving God with their life, then this message isn't for you yet. That's fine. We'll, we'll, but we'll record it so when you change your mind later and you decide you want to know how to partner with God and everything, come back and listen to this one, all right? It'll be called the six-letter F word part three, okay? Just for later. But for those of us who really want to do everything that God <laughs> wants us to do, the rest of this message is for you. But let's put this in context. So Luke chapter one, verse 17, I have a confession for you. Uh, the first time I heard this, I thought it was talking about Jesus. And in fact, there's something in my mind that wants this to be talking about Jesus. It sounds like a Jesus-y thing to say, right? He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And, and, and inside the church guy in me goes, yes, do it, Lord. Turn the hearts of the father to the children. Do that miracle, God. And then I, I can't help it. I'm a student, so I have to go read the textbook. And I, and I go and I read the textbook, and I, and I actually find out that it's not talking about Jesus. It's actually talking about a guy named John. A, a guy named John that later on earns the nickname John the Baptist, which I, this is going to blow your mind. He was called that because he would baptize people. So they called him John the Baptist. But as, as I was studying this, you guys didn't think that was funny. That's all right. In retrospect, I won't either. But I was studying this this month, and I, and I really actually felt like God was helping me to understand something about this, this, this verse, Luke 1, 17, or this portion and this promise, it is this, that the heart of the Father really does, and, and we're already going to agree to this, it needs to be restored among God's people, right? It needs to be restored among God's people, and, and that needs to be physical fatherhood and spiritual fatherhood, and that this is not just a job that God does, it's a job that we are supposed to do, and I know I've said all of that to you already, but this was the thing that helped me realize that this is, a, this is my job, and this is Kyle's job, right? And this is Ryland's job. See, God used John the Baptist, just some guy. He used John to redeem fatherhood, that six-letter F word, in his day and in his time. See, something about the ministry of of John, something about the stuff John was out and about doing was the reason why God was able to say about him, he will turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children. It wasn't Jesus who did that. It was John who did. Something about John made that a reality. And, and so I want to know what was it about John because if I'm supposed to do this job too, and I'm intimidated by it, or I feel disqualified, what is it about John that helps me know how I maybe can fulfill my job as well, right? So let me just share with you a few things that John gave away to people as he was being a spiritual father that we can see from his story. The first thing that we see that John gave to people is he, number one, gave discipline. I know that's a great way to start an encouraging sermon, right? Let's talk about discipline. But in fact, let's, let's read how John gives discipline. In Luke, same book, chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. So this was what he was out there doing. And then in Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 5, 
it's really telling the same story, but from Matthew's perspective, he says this, people from Jerusalem and from all Judea, the surrounding area, and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. All kinds of people came out to hear what he was talking about. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees, who were like the religious leaders of the Jewish church of that time, when he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, notice that they weren't coming to be baptized, they were coming to see what he was up to, he denounced them, which is an old school way of saying he put them on blast. He called them out, right? He says this, you brood of snakes, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Now, I know that that doesn't sound very kind. But I want to tell you that that actually might have been the greatest kindness that John could have offered to these religious leaders. Here is what John was doing. He was out there offering discipline. Now, when, when I think of the word discipline, I think of how I had a German mother which already makes some of you feel bad for me, but it's okay. She was a very good German mother. But the thing about a German mother is that when she says, you better not do that again, you had better not do that again, right? And I don't know if you had a German mother or not, but maybe some of you can relate to having a parent who, when you heard the discipline phrase, you just knew I had better not do that thing ever again, right? Like, I won't tell you all of the stories, but I just know that there were some times in my life that I could point to of when I learned what being afraid of God felt like because of my mother, right? Here's the thing, though, is that my mom never hit me. She, she never, but which, by the way, let's just draw a subtle line. I think that there's a difference when I say my mom never hit me and when I should also say my mom did spank me. Like, we had one spoon that was never used for cooking. You know? <laughs> Got another amen on that one. <laughs> My mom never abused me. She disciplined me. Right? And my mom used to say those things like, <laughs> this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, which is not true. It's not true. It's not, it's not, it's not true. No, it's not true. It's just not true. That hurts. It's not true. It hurt me more than it hurt her. I'm not saying I think she enjoyed it, but. But you know what's interesting is all of that just is the consequence of action. You know, discipline actually begins not with a wooden spoon on your butt because you did something dumb and probably deserved it. Definitely deserved it. Um, discipline didn't begin there. Discipline begins with the truth. Consequence happens. Discipline actually begins with a willingness to tell the truth. See, we're taught in Scripture to go out and tell people the truth in love, right? Right? Not the truth in yelling, not the truth in abuse, not the truth in my way or the highway attitudes. It's go tell the truth in love, yeah. right? Certainly there are consequences. And I, I love the stories that I can tell about my German mother who had, gave me, who had given me consequences and, and then other times given me grace. But you know what she gave me all the time? was discipline that began with truth. And what that sounds like is this, Tim, the thing you did was not the right thing to do. And then I would have to go, I know. And then it'd be the conversation about, well, now let's talk about the consequence. And sometimes the consequence would be a spanking. And then once I started laughing at that, uh, there was a time, there was one day, the last day I ever got a spanking, I laughed about it. And she said, okay, we're gonna have to find something else. And then I discovered what the word grounded meant right? And then other times there was grace, but there was always truth, because that's how discipline 
begins. And I, I love that John was not afraid to speak the truth. I, I love that he called sin, sin, and he called out sin, and he, he, he wasn't afraid of whomever he was talking to. You see, John was an equal opportunity disciplinarian. He would call uh, truth out to all of the people from all of the Jordan Valley, all over the place, on both sides of the Jordan. Whoever wanted to come, I'm going to tell you the truth. And then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, and, and he even told them the truth. And then later on, you can read in chapter 3 that he even goes to the Roman governor. His name was Herod, and he told him the truth. And Herod didn't really like the truth that John told him, so he threw John in prison. We'll come back around to that being relevant a little bit later. But John was just interested in telling the truth. This is where discipline begins. So the lesson is not to just run our mouth. The lesson is to love people enough to tell them the truth. The, the truth is sin is any behavior that falls short of God's standard and that sin has eternal consequences, separation from God for all of eternity, but that the repentance and forgiveness of sins is available for every single person. On this side of the cross of Jesus, the truth is sin is sin, Sin has consequences, but the grace you get is if you repent and are baptized and give your life to Jesus, you get to be reconciled to the Father. And now discipline looks like being a disciple, a follower, a student, a, a representative, a person who's following after the way of Jesus. You see, John teaches us the first important lesson of godly parenting. You have to give your children the gift of discipline. Right, you, like you, you've seen them, the kids running around with no discipline. You know that it's not really actually their fault that they're crazy. It's that nobody has disciplined them. So they're actually running around in the world thinking they can get away with something because the person who told them, who should have told them that they can't get away with everything, didn't tell them that. They didn't discipline them. So they're not a disciplined person, right? We need truth in order to be a disciplined person. We have to teach people the difference between right and wrong. And can I just tell you, just so that it has been said in public for you to hear, and hopefully you can agree with this, in 2019, there is still a right and there is still a wrong. It is all clearly articulated in the Word of God, and everything that disagrees with the Word of God is wrong, and everything that agrees with it is right. This is the standard. It's the one and only standard. There's no other book, and I mean, there's been like extensive studies on this. There is no other book that has the weight of authority historically, let alone spiritually, than this book, right? It, it is the only one that stands as truth with a capital ultimate T. Still in 2019, what this calls sin is still sin. And what this calls righteousness is still righteousness. And we can be jerks about that or we can be loving about that. Let's be loving about it. But it's still truth. Amen? See, discipline is not simply punishment. We have to remember this. I wasn't just being disciplined because I was getting spanked. I was getting disciplined because I was being told the truth in love, right? Proverbs 3.12 says, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you for the Lord corrects those he loves. Just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Proverbs 13, 24 actually doubles, doubles down on this. It says, those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. I'm not telling you how to discipline your children. I'm saying if you don't, you don't love them. Okay, let's rephrase that. I'm not saying that at all. God is saying if you don't discipline your children, you don't love them. Because you're letting them just be undisciplined. And then when they go crazy, that's on you. Because you didn't love them. Love is active. and Your active love is to tell them the truth and discipline them. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. So we partner with God to redeem fatherhood when we give discipline to those people that we would say are our spiritual children 
children. We probably also could preach this message and say that those of us who are disciples need to be submitted to those who are our spiritual covering and our spiritual parents so that when somebody comes along and disciplines us that we say thank you to them and we receive it because we know it's a sign of love, right? Again, this is not a license for us to go around and tell everyone that they're going to hell and that they're a terrible person. Please don't do that. That's just called being rude. Do not do that. But it is a command to love everyone enough to tell them the truth. All the more so if you're taking responsibility for their journey with Jesus. The best discipline always leads to reconciliation with the Father. And we know that because John's discipline of the people that came out ended in reconciliation with the Father if they repented and were baptized. All, reconcilia- all, all discipline ends with reconciliation if the person being disciplined chooses to be disciplined. Does this make sense? I was speaking with somebody recently who was just like super angry and I was trying to just be, tell the truth and love to this person and they just were like were attacking, attacking, attacking. And I just finally said, look man, you have a choice. You, you can see me as an ally and as a friend. I'm trying to help you. The way you're speaking, you're, like you're crossing lines, it's just not cool. It's not awesome. It's not helpful. And you're going to hurt a lot of relationships. And then he responded with more attacks. Oh, blah, 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 right? Just attacking, attacking, being angry. And he wasn't even angry at me. He's just in so much pain that he just was vomiting all of that over me. And my response was just, look, buddy, just choose. You just choose. And he chose. And his choice was, I'm done. You're not seeing it my way. Blah, 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 blah. So we ended the conversation. And as of right now, that's going to be it. Because he chose. He chose. And part of the choice was, you're not an authority in my life. You don't get to say what I am going to do. And I said, okay, cool. That's fine. Because you chose. And, I, and that doesn't mean that I'm not a good person. It doesn't mean that he's not a good person. It means he made a choice. And there may or may not be consequences for that, but I'm not his father, so I don't get to decide. Does that make sense? Oh, there were some deep cuts in there about leadership uh, and, and how to love people, by the way. Cut the part about how you don't get to decide, that's, that's some good wisdom right there. But well, that maybe is for another sermon. We'll move on. Okay, so the best discipline always leads to reconciliation as long as we choose. Yes? Here's the second thing that John gives. He gives advice. So John has gathered this crowd out there, and he's baptizing all of these people, and these people start asking questions. In fact, if you look in Luke chapter 3, you can begin to see some of the questions that these people ask. And man, they actually ask some pretty profound questions. Here here are the profound questions. Uh, The crowd asks, Profound question number one. Just folks in the crowd. What should we do? That's a really profound, good question. Just tell me what to do, like, you know, with my whole life and all of it. And John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, teacher, what should we do? Profound question number two. Man, these people are brilliant, asking great questions. What do we do? And John says, watch this, you begin to see the, the, the wisdom of John here. He sa- they say, uh, teacher, what should we do, the tax collectors? He says, collect no more taxes than the government requires. Notice how he didn't just give the same answer to the second group of people as he did. For the, uh, let's move on, verse 14. What should we do, asked some soldiers. John replied, don't extort money or make false accusations and be content with your pay. Third question Same question every time. Different person asking the question, different advice to the person asking the question. You see, the gift that John gives these people is practical wisdom. Not long-winded, right? Loving, encouraging, positive, not a speech, just wisdom. He, He gave them advice. A good parent just seems to be that, like a dispenser of practical wisdom. Maybe you didn't have that in your life, but you can begin to think of people who are a little bit further down the road than you, and they just always seem to have practical wisdom and advice. That's a sign of a good parent-type person. But can I just tell you, if you want to be a good parent, if you want to help God redeem the, the heart of the Father in the church and in the world, 
You can't give what you don't have. We are supposed to be people of wisdom. And you can't give away what you don't have. And there's a lot of people out there who are trying to give wisdom away, and it turns out what they're saying lacks wisdom. And the reason for that is because the source of all wisdom is God and his word. And if you're trying to give from something that you're not pulling from, then eventually you're going to run out of anecdotes. But the Bible doesn't run out of wisdom. So the prerequisite for being a good parent is to spend time in God's word. Can, can I just make this super practical for you? There's a great wisdom book. It's called Proverbs. There are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. I had someone tell me one time, why don't you just wake up every morning and read one chapter of Proverbs? Just one whole proverb, chapter one on January one, right? And, and then January two, read proverb two, right? And, he, and he's like, if you can count and you know what day it is, you can totally do this. And then you get to the 31st day of the month and, and you read that one and then you get to the first day of the next month and you just start over. And then you get to February and it's a little bit weird. So you like double up on like two of the days, right? So you read like, Proverbs 1 and 2, and then on the 2nd, you go Proverbs 3 and 4, you get to, or maybe you just get to the 28th, and you just go 28, 29, 30, 31, whatever you want to do. But here's the point. There's wisdom for you for every single day. The guy that told me that, he said, for five years, I've been reading Proverbs, one chapter every day, and it's changed my life completely. And this guy had some wisdom. He just was like, it was like he was just throwing it around like candy. Like every single time he'd be in an encounter, he would just be like, oh, I've got a piece of wisdom for that. Here, here you go. Because you can give away what you have stored up in your heart. And then when someone comes to you with good questions, you'd be amazed at if you're collecting wisdom, how you can give it away. The challenge is you have to actually be going to the right source, right? I mean, could you imagine if you went to somebody and said, hey, you have any, you have any breath mints on you? And, and, and like they pulled seaweed out of their pocket? Yeah, your reaction to that would be, that seems not only like really random, but unhelpful to the need that I came to you with. And that's like coming to somebody and asking for wisdom and advice, and what they give you is something they just pulled out of their back pocket. Wisdom is when you bring a person to the wisdom of the truth of the word of God. We should be people, if we want to partner with God to redeem the heart of the Father, we should be people who bring them to the truth. And no wonder people don't trust God. Too many of us who represent him don't actually talk about his wisdom from his word. We just tell people our opinion that we're pulling out of our something that I probably shouldn't say from the pulpit. Let's call it ear. We'll just call it our ear, right? We're just pulling. Yeah, that's what I meant. But seriously, a lot of people don't trust the word because a lot of people who claim to represent the word don't know the word, and then they talk like they know the word, but they don't. And we're running around misquoting scripture and saying things like, God helps those who help themselves. That's not biblical. You didn't read that in the word. Please shut your mouth. You can't give away what you don't have. And the counterfeit version of it will only hurt people. And if you go around hurting people representing the Father, you're hurting their ability to trust Him. You had better know the Word. Right? Okay, let's move on to the third one because I feel like I just almost maybe stepped on your toes there a little bit. And you know, everyone's welcome here at Life Church. We don't want, well, we absolutely want to step on your toes. Okay, I just admit that. Here's the third one. The third thing that John gives is direction. Remember that I told you earlier how John got arrested because he spoke truth to power and power didn't like it? Herod, the Roman governor, he was like not a fan and that landed him in prison, right? So watch what John does when he's in prison. In Matthew chapter 11, we see one of the uh, accounts of John's time in prison. In verse uh, 2, starting in verse 2, it says, John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all these things the Messiah, Jesus, was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, 
Are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? Now, I want to tell you, this is actually a great picture of that feeling that we all have when someone we're trying to be a help to comes to us with a question, and we don't want them to know that we have no idea how to help them. I don't know if I'm the only one in the room, but I have had experiences where someone has come and asked me my opinion or my advice to give them wisdom, and I, I want to be like Pastor Tim, which is like, yeah, I can totally help you. I absolutely have an answer for that question. But on the inside, I'm like 13-year-old Tim who has no idea about anything all the time. And I'm going, oh, no. They're going to find me out. I don't know anything at all. With the voice. And John in prison sending his disciples to Jesus is actually a perfect metaphor for that moment and how we should behave. Because it's the moment when 13-year-old Tim with the crackly voice is inside going, I hope they don't find me out. And somebody is standing in front of me looking for advice and I have none to give them that I feel imprisoned by my own weakness. It's that moment where I feel like, you know what, I'm not good enough again for this person. And I can be defeated and bound and imprisoned and just say, look, I'm in here bound in my not enoughness for you. Or I can do what John did as a good spiritual father and say, hey, there's this guy I'm hearing about. He's doing a lot of incredible things. Why don't you go to him with a question? See, a good spiritual parent will say, why don't you go to Jesus with your question? Because I got to be honest with you, I don't know can I tell you that some of the best words I've ever said as a pastor have been, I don't know? I love the face that people make when I say that phrase, by the way. People who don't know me very well yet, and they, they, don't know, they haven't heard me say, I don't know, come to me, and they go, Pastor Tim, blah, 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 question mark. And I go, I don't know. And they go, oh, no, on the inside. <laughs> on the outside, they go, Like, like that time in a video game where you get to the place in the, in the level where you literally, like, you don't know the next thing and you know your friend has beat this level. Like, you know somebody else has come to this point in their life and they figured it out and you're standing here and you feel like there's absolutely no way to get to the next level and you're just waiting for a cheat code. Like, that's the feeling that must be going on in someone's mind when I look at them and go, I don't know. And yet it's one of the most liberating things because the next thing I get to say is, but I know who does. And so I get to be like John and say, why don't we go to Jesus with your question? And I love how this story plays out, by the way, because if you read the story in Matthew chapter 11, the disciples show up to Jesus. They ask the question that John sent them with because he's a good disciple maker. He says, go ask Jesus the question. Jesus gives them a response. Guarantee you it wasn't the response that they were expecting because that's a very Jesus-y thing to do. And then he sends them back with stuff to talk to John about. So then they come back to John, and I promise you the first words out of John's mouth when the disciples returned from hanging out with Jesus was, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? Because a good spiritual parent will send you to Jesus when they don't have the advice in the, own, in the well of their own heart. Will send you to Jesus. Because what they're trying to teach you in that moment is, I don't need to be enough for you. Because Jesus already is. And this should be the point in the message where all of us who started hearing Luke 1.17, turn the hearts to the, of the fathers to the children, and hearing that this is a responsibility that all of us have been given to make disciple-making disciple-makers. In that moment earlier in the message when you all went, I'm not good enough to do that, and that 13-year-old crackly voice self inside of you disqualified you before I even began the message, this is the part where you get to go, oh, yeah. I actually could do this. And some of you are really excited about that, and some of you are really frustrated at me because I just put you on the hook and I took away your excuse. <laughs> you're welcome for both of those. Look, if you're breathing air, 
You have to be making disciples. And can I just tell you, you can totally do it. You absolutely can. Because you're not enough, but you know the person who is. This is what John models for us. I don't know everything, but I can help you get to Jesus. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 says, Direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. I love this as a promise, but it's also a job description. Direct your children onto the right path means teach your children how to go to Jesus with questions. We all need disciples. We all need disciple makers. We all need spiritual parents. We need a spiritual covering. But you need to be making disciples. And when you're not enough, which is going to be a lot of times, direct your children onto the right path. John did this by showing them, hey, Jesus is the answer. Let me show you how to walk to him. Then he's going to send you back to me so we can debrief and figure out what we're going to do from here. Being a spiritual parent does not mean that you have to be perfect. In fact, not being perfect is your superpower. It's what qualifies you because you know the one who is. Amen? There's 19.7 million children in the United States living with no father figure. There are 327.2 million people currently alive in the United States as of 2018. 246 million of those 327 million people claim to be Christians. Out of those 327 million people living in the United States, there are about 600,000 people living in the Antelope Valley. Based on national averages, there are about 450,000 people living in the Antelope Valley who would call themselves a Christian. You're one of them. You're one of 450,000. But I wonder, out of 600,000 people, 450,000 of whom claim to be Christians, how many of them are living without any spiritual covering at all? How many of us thought that just coming to church and having a pastor meant I have a spiritual covering? And I'm not telling you I'm not willing to be a spiritual covering for you, but in a shepherd sense, I don't know that I'm everybody's parent. Does this make sense to you? Paul wrote a letter and he says, I am your spiritual father. And the people he was talking to were the people he literally led them to Jesus. The person who leads you to Jesus is your spiritual parent. And the person you are leading to Jesus, you have chosen to become a spiritual parent to. Out of 600,000 people living in the Antelope Valley, I wonder how many of us are going this thing alone. And no wonder we're so dysfunctional. No wonder we have so much drama. No wonder we're all pretending that we have it all together because no one taught us that it was okay not to. No wonder that we don't have wisdom because no one led us to Jesus to get it. No wonder most of us don't know how to read the Bible because no one raised us to do it. We just met Jesus and thought, if I just come back to church a couple Sundays a month, then I'll be a Christian. And the heart of the Father is broken and hurting for his children because we don't even know how to be kids, let alone how to be parents. And I know that sounds super hopeless, but literally all you need to do is be willing to tell the truth, give a person some discipline. Dig into the word and then when someone asks you, give the advice that you have stored up in your heart and then when you run out of advice for the person standing in front of you, direct them to Jesus. Yes, I recognize that I have broken a cardinal rule of preaching at Life Church and used an acronym, but it would be great if you would be a dad. Some of you were like, we don't use acronyms? We don't use acronyms. <laughs> can, can you, Adam, can you put that slide up on the screen for us for a second? I wonder if you could do some homework, and this is how we're going to wrap up our, our day. I wonder if you could do some homework with me 
And uh, get your phone out, and maybe you don't want to get your phone out because you're super old school, and we respect that. Uh, I didn't say old, I said old school. I wonder if you could just do some homework with me and take your phone and just take a, take a screenshot of, of this. A screenshot? A picture. They call it a picture. Kids these days call them pictures. Uh, it, is a, it is a picture of a screen. Thanks, Erica. <laughs> a sh- take a shot of the screen. And now here's, a, here's why I'm having you do this. And I, I know this, seems, this might seem like an odd way to end a, end a sermon, but, I, but I'm actually, I, I, I've wanted to just lead up this whole series to giving you some homework. Because I really feel like we can, we can have lots of spiritual encounters, and I think that we've had those over the last couple of weeks as we talk about God being a good father and God being a good father who gives good gifts to his kids. But the whole reason he is a good father who gives good gifts to his kids is so that we can be blessed to be a blessing. God wants you to be so blessed that you can overflow blessing into other people. And so here's my homework for you. You've taken a picture of your job description to be a person who's willing to give discipline, advice, and direction. Now what I'm not telling you is that your homework is now to go out and show your screen to every single person and go, I'm going to give this to you today. But here's what I have on my mind that maybe you could do. Think about the names of two people that you know. Social media doesn't count. Because you don't don't know those people. What I mean by know is like you see them with your eyes, and when you see them with your eyes, you can also touch them. Right? To to have a physical, personal relationship with somebody. And now, narrow, narrow the kinds of people that you're thinking down to people that you know that need spiritual parents. 450,000 people living in the Antelope Valley who claim to be Christians. You probably know a couple of those. Somebody that you know, 600,000 people living in the Antelope Valley in general, only 400,000, give or take, claim to be Christians. So the people I'm talking about are people that you personally have a relationship with and people that you could take out to a cup of coffee or invite over to your home or meet for a walk at the park and that need somebody to tell them the truth in love, because you're not rude, that need somebody to give them advice and that need someone to direct them toward Jesus. Now, I'm asking you to think of two people. And what I mean by that is I'm inviting you to pray with Jesus, talk with him about who might God have already put in your life that what you have in you is a perfect fit for what they need. Right? Now, this is going to take a degree of humility, so I'm trusting you to be humble. If you go running around town going, my pastor told me to be everybody's spiritual parent, you're lying. That's not what I told you. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Two people that you think if you sat down with them and and here's, look, this is how this conversation is going to go, okay? You're going to sit down with them and you're going to go, hey, Marcus, I was praying about how God could use me and you came to my mind. I'm wondering if there's anything that I could do to help you. I just wanted you to know I'm available. If you ever need anything, if you ever need any kind of advice or you just want to talk to somebody, if you ever just have questions and you want somebody who will point you to Jesus, I just want you to know when I was praying, you came to my mind. Please don't go to them and say, hey, I was praying for you and God told me I am your spiritual parent. Don't say that, that's weird. Weird people say stuff like that. Don't be a weirdo. You don't, at least if you're going to be weird, don't tell them you go to life church. Amen. Right? All right. But let's just simplify this. Hey, Marcus, I was praying. When I was praying, I was asking God if there was people that I could be a help to because I feel like I have a responsibility to help people. And And I was praying, and man, your name came to my mind. Marcus, I I just want to ask, is there anything I could offer to you to be a help? 
And here's the thing. You're going to ask two people. If even one of them says yes, you're now discipling one more person than you were before you had that conversation. It's like a 100% increase if you're not currently discipling anybody. You're going from discipling nobody to discipling 100% more people. It's pretty good. And here, here's the deal. You're not going to have all the time for them. You're not going to constantly be available. You're not going to move into their house or have them move into your house. You're, right? You're, you're not going to... Listen, watch. This is okay. It's 2019. This is okay. You're not even going to answer the phone every time they call. <gasps> you didn't know your pastor screens phone calls like a boss. <clears throat> Because, watch, I, like, I got a phone call from somebody recently, and I was at a family thing. Guess who comes first? Right? But get who, guess who does come? The person who called me. Right? So I messaged, hey, this is when I can get together. Let's get together, and we schedule a meetup, and we're going to meet up. But that happens all the time. You don't, like, being a spiritual parent, you understand, like, that I'm a really good dad, and there are chunks out of the day that I send my kids away from me. We call that school. Like, I just trust that other people... <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm not asking you to have somebody run your life. Jesus runs your life. You're just being a spiritual parent. And being a good spiritual parent is not that they overwhelm you with all their stuff. It's that you are teaching them the path towards Jesus. So all those times that you're afraid, just take a breath and remember that you're not perfect. Nobody needs you to be. You're just available. Yes. You're just here. You're just you. Yes. It's that simple. Right. And I really, really wonder what would happen if the church would just parent people. And I think we could change the world. In fact, you could change the world for one person if you would just be willing to be a disciple maker. It's, and it's this simple. Just point the person to Jesus. Can we pray? God, I thank you that you are a good father. And I really, really believe that there is something in your heart that says that you are not only just a good father to us, but you are the person calling us to fatherhood. That you're the, you're the one calling us to be sons and daughters of the Most High God who invite others to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. Lord, I believe that you are calling us to step into a culture of disciple making. Help us to believe in who you have said we are. That through you, we are enough. Only through you, we are enough. Help us to stop trying to perform to be smart enough to make disciples. Heal those places where we're afraid to be used by you and where we disqualify ourselves. Help us to receive the mandate to make disciples in the same way we received your love to be a disciple. For those of us who are just feeling completely disqualified, would you give us the name of a person that we would look at and say, you know what, actually, I think I could just love that person. I think I could just love that person and point them to you, God. Give us those names this week. For those of us who come in here and we're still even now sitting here feeling like, but nobody has loved me like that. Would you heal our hearts? And God, I pray that as we go to pray, that you would put those names, the people in the room who are feeling unloved and unseen and like nobody has been a spiritual parent to them and they just really wish that someone would see them. God, would you put those names on the hearts of other people, even in this church? And God, just begin to create connections. God, do a supernatural work of connecting hearts in this church and outside of this church as well so that we can grow your kingdom as we commit to making disciples who make disciples who make disciples and so on. God, we receive your word. 
If this was for you today, if you were receiving a word from the Lord today as a mandate and direction and encouragement, can you just verbalize that to God? Just take the next moment and just say to God, God, I've heard something from your word today. I thank you for the encouragement. I thank you for the challenge. I thank you for the truth spoken in love. I thank you that you believe in me enough to want to use me to change somebody's life and to point someone to you. Begin to just say to him, God, I ask that you would help me to be able to speak the truth in love. God, I commit to dig into your word so that I can find advice to give to people that is your advice, not my opinion. And God, I commit to direct people to you when my advice runs out because it absolutely will. But I thank you, God, that you are enough in the moments that I'm not and together we can be enough for other people to find you. God, as we commit to this, would you answer our prayers? Would you build this church not to have butts in seats, but to build your kingdom? And so that we can say that 600,000 people in the Antelope Valley have spiritual parents and are spiritually parenting. God, I, I just have big enough faith for that. That 600,000 people could fall in love with you. God, would you use our lives to do it? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you heard God say something good to you this morning, can you say thank you to him real quick? And Sharon's going to come and wrap up our service.